But I got a question for you this morning, and uh, I'm just curious from my own, because I've been a singer all my life, uh, standing in the pew when I was a baby with, with uh, diapers on my, I've got recordings of my grandmother, she was sitting there, and we were singing beside her, and I have a question, how many of y'all have sang a song before? Okay, I, w- I want to see hands this morning, how many of y'all have sang, come on now, this is the church, this- but we've all sang a song, nobody may never been around. It may have been a time that we're by ourselves in the shower, in the bathroom, in the woods, somewhere. But we all have sang a song before. You see, there is something about singing a song that does the body good. Let's take our Bibles and turn it to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. We'll start in verse 27, very familiar scripture, passage, story, but I want to read it this morning and and, and shed some light on this passage of scripture this morning. I hear pages turning, I'll wait just a second. Starting in verse 27, and Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the receipt, and the sea returned to his strength. When the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, there remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Chapter 15 verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake saying, I will sing Unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. What a song. You see... This chapter continues on describing the worship. It keeps describing the singing, the tambourine playing, all these things that happened after the children of Israel were delivered across the Red Sea out of Pharaoh's hand. But you see, leading up to this wonderful time of rejoicing, this wonderful time of singing, this wonderful time of dancing, God's people were in a bind. God had delivered his people from 400 years of Egyptian bondage. And through a series of events, they found themselves at the Red Sea with mountains on both sides of them. Nowhere to go, and they look back and they see the dust coming and the cloud of of, of chariots and soldiers coming their way uh, to to, to trap them and, and, and kill them and them die by the sword right there on the edge of the Red Sea. Let's go back to chapter 14, verse 10, if you're still there. And it says in verse 10, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, Hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not. 
Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians who you have seen today, you shall see them again no more. You see, I know we've probably all read this account. We may have seen Charlton Heston lead the children across the desert. We may have seen all these things and know this story very well. But I want us to look at it a little bit deeper. You see, it was a panic time in the camp of Israel. Men shook with fear and women and children wept as they huddled around grandparents and relatives. And suddenly Moses was mobbed by the the irate family leaders who cried, Surely this is the end. Weren't there enough graves in Egypt to bury us there? You had to drag us out here to die? We told you, Moses, we told you that we were better off in Egypt. We were better off in bondage. We were better off in the way it was. We were, at least we were able to live there. Moses, what are you doing? Didn't we tell you this would happen? They were fearful. They were scared. They were discouraged. And I ask you this morning, have you ever been like that? You ever been fearful, discouraged, scared, depressed, oppressed? But then the scripture goes on to say, then God miraculously rolled the sea back. What a victory it must have been. The very thing that they had known their whole life, the very bondage, the very turmoil they had known their whole life had now been covered by the sea. You see this morning it is easy to sing a song of triumph. After the battle's over. Would y'all agree with me this morning? After the trial is through. But it ain't so easy to sing a song when you're going through it. Just like the children of Israel, we have a tendency to complain, to murmur. And that makes us become entrapped by the very thing that God is fixing to get glory in. And just like the children of Israel, we sing the right song on the wrong side. The right song on the wrong side. I had a friend, as I was talking to him this week, he told me that phrase. He said he had listened to a message. And when I said, what did you say? He said, the right song on the wrong side. I said, say it again. He said, the right song on the wrong side. And I began to think about that. And it hit me hard how often... I am overcome with worry of things that I am facing, things that seem to be too big for me to overcome. You see, I can surely praise him when things work out. Amen? You see, I can surely worship him when I'm feeling good, and I can about have myself a hallelujah time when I'm on the mountaintop. But what about when I am pressed When I have been trapped, the sea is at in front of me, and the enemy is at my back pressing in. How many times has my personal song of victory been silenced? My song of adoration to him, my song, the song he gave me, and only he gave me, and the song that he gave you. What a sight. Dancing, singing, tambourine playing. All that was good. But you see, God's people had failed the test on the other side of the sea. And this is a word from the Lord today. In the time and in the day we are living in, God needs his children to learn to sing a song of deliverance during the testing side of the trouble. I want to say that one more time. In the time and in the day, with COVID and everything that's around us, Political correctness and, and consti- the constitutionality of things. All these things that are surrounding us. God needs his children to learn to sing a song of deliverance during the testing side of this. We know it. There's coming a day. We talk about, me and Phyllis had a good comment. We talk about the rapture happen, but I don't want us to look at the rapture as a way of escape. But look at the rapture as God's taking us out of here one day, but he wants us to be busy right now. From Genesis to Revelations, from Adam and Eve to Noah to Abraham to Moses to Jesus being born, living, walking, uh, being crucified, dying, being placed in the tomb, resurrected on the third day, and he's soon coming back as King of King and Lord of Lords. All this is in this book. And all of it is about 
the redemption of God for his people. He started off in a perfect perfect place called the garden, and he's going to finish us off in a perfect place. No more sin, no more dying, no more uh, problems. But let me tell you, God's going to make all things new. And if you, you have accepted Christ as your Savior this morning, made him Lord of your life, every promise, every plan, everything that's contained in these 66 books is you. You have something to sing about. I want to say that again. You have something to sing about this morning. You see, in Psalms 137, it's a sad sight. God's children had been taken into Babylonian captivity. They were there, and they, they, if you read, you, you see what happened. That's when Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and uh, all these different uh, characters in the Bible, they were taken away at that time, and they were in captivity. And in Psalms 137, it says this, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. We wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For they that carried us away captive required us a song. And they that wasted us required us mirth, saying, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. I believe in the context here, they were making fun of the ones that used to sing. They were making fun of the ones that used to have the power. They were making fun of the ones that used to have the victory. But because of captivity in their life, they had lost their songs. And the ones that held them captives were saying, go ahead, sing me one of those songs. Go ahead. And I believe that's what Satan's doing today. He's got God's people so fearful, God's people so empowered, and he's chaunting us saying, sing a song. Sing a song. And I'm telling you this morning, it is time and and past time that we as God's people stand up and sing the song of what he's done for us. Sing a song of how he's delivered us. Sing a song of where he's taken us to because there is a lost and dark and dying world that needs to hear about Jesus. Hallelujah. They hung up their harps. Anytime we get together and sing, the instruments come out first. And they'll go to play and sing, you know, just mess around. All of a sudden, the singing starts. <clears throat> you see, when, the, when me, Benji, and Alex go out and sing, if it's going to be a long sing, we'll take our instruments because we know there's times that, that maybe our song will get weak or our voices will get weak, and when we can't sing, we can play. It's just part of it. But when we set down our instruments, we're done. And I want to say that in this passage, they, have, they had even put their harps up. Not only was their song gone, they put the things up that helped support their singing. They put the things up that helped bring in worship and, and help the Spirit of God move. They were through. But I want to tell you this morning in a simple message, no matter what you are facing, no matter what you're going through, keep singing. Keep singing. It is not in the ability or how it sounds to one another, it is all about the author of the song. You see, I, th- this came to me last night, 12 o'clock, laying in bed. I had to get up, turn the light on, and write it down. You see, the song doesn't come from our strength. Our strength comes from the song. I want to repeat that one more time. The song doesn't come from our strength. Our strength comes from the song. And every child of God that's sitting in these pews today has a song. Oh, the power of the song. You say, Johnny, I ain't got nothing to sing about. We can sing about God's freedom. Psalm 68, 6 verse 4 says this. Sing unto the Lord. Actually, Psalm 68. Verse 6, sing unto the Lord, praises to his name, extol, 
Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name Jah, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless, a judge to the widows, is God in his holy habitation. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound by change. We could sing of God's love. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. We can sing about what God's done. Oh, give Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Sing songs unto him. Talk ye of his wondrous works. We can sing for joy. Let the priest be clothed with righteousness and let thy saints shout for joy. We can sing our whole life. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I am my being. I'm telling you today, God's given us a song in our life, and he wants you to sing it. It's so important that you sing it because there's people that only you will affect with your song. Oh, hallelujah. I'm thankful God gives me an opportunity to preach and opportunity to sing. But this is not, this is trying to encourage y'all because the Bible says one can send a thousand to flight, two can send ten thousand to flight, and a cord of three is not easily broken. This is a team thing. This is a body thing. And I'm trying to encourage you this morning to sing your song because your song is going to go places that I can't go. There's going to be people that listen to your song that won't listen to my song. Hallelujah. You see, Colossians 3.16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And I say it one more time this morning, keep singing. That's not getting up. and you know, Jason, that's not mean you get up here and oh, sing. But it means saying I was once lost, but now I'm found. And I want to tell you what he did for me. And when you tell somebody else, somebody else can tell somebody else. But you may say this morning, Johnny, you don't know what I'm facing. What's happening in my life. What I've been through. What someone has done for me, to me. I have lost my song. I don't feel like singing anymore. I just want to tell you a little bit. I, I, you know, we have a lot of stuff going on, and we've we've talked about it about at work and and things like that. And COVID's got us all messed up, and all kinds of things are happening. And and I just ain't ain't been right. I don't know what it, I was telling Alex this morning. I, I don't know what it is, but I begin to put these pieces together. First of all, I've not been singing on the right side. And I've been doing exactly what I needed to be done. We just went through a, a trial and a tribulation, and it's, it worked out in our favor, and I'm thankful for it, and I'm excited. But God convicted me and said, you should have been just as excited when, I, when it didn't look like it was going to happen, when it didn't look like things were going to work out, because I'm in control. And the song is about me, not about your circumstance. The song is about him, and that's why we can sing it, because he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He won't fail us. It's all right to give him a hand clap of praise. That's part of your song. You see, I will give you this morning the same advice that Moses gave God's people. There were some simple things he said right there on the side of that seashore while people were, while the dust was coming and and all this, I can envision it, man. I'd be scary. You know, in them desert movies, the first thing you see is a big cloud of dust first, and all of a sudden, then you can see what's happening. You see, he tells them to fear not. That's pretty easy. Fear not. Okay. Okay, Moses, you want me not to fear and look. You see, see what's happening? The majority of our struggles arise from fear. Fear of exception, fear of rejection, fear of loss, fear of gain, fear of death, of sickness, fear, fear, fear. 
That's what it all is. And I guarantee you this week you have feared something in your life. It's just what it is. I dig a, did a Google search on the acrostic of fear. And you know what acrostic is. It's a, it's a play on the letters of the, of the words. And, and, I, and I seen this acrostic and I was like, wow. Fear is false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. Another person put it as false expectation appearing real. You see, I believe it starts out as false evidence. We see it, we're like, oh, that's going to happen. I'm going to tell you, 99% of the stuff we fear never happens. But we sit there and we look at the evidence of it and it appears real to us. And the what if start. But you want, you see, I believe it starts with that evidence. I believe it grows in it, into expectation because fear, and you've heard it many times, but fear is the opposite of faith. Hebrews 11, 1 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see, there is that word evidence again from the Bible. Are you looking at the evidence of fear or are you looking at the evidence of faith? Because see, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence is a tangible thing of the evidence of the things not seen. In, in the Pentecostal world, we say not yet seen and we have anticipation for it. But that scripture says not seen, meaning those things have already happened in the spirit world. Those things have already taken place and it's a substance of the evidence of relying on God to bring it into fruition. Those prayers you've prayed, those lost loved ones you sought God for, you can put it down and begin to sing your song. Sing it. Oh, God, I see him coming into the church. Oh, God, I see him coming to the altar. Oh, God, I see him turning their life over because that's what faith will do in your life. Oh, hallelujah. For God did not give us a spirit of fear but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. And I want to read the rest of this scripture. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor for me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world even began. I want to tell you the reason we don't have to have a spirit of fear. Because the spirit that God gives is not a timid spirit. It's a spirit of power. It's a spirit of joy, long-suffering, meekness, temperance. And against such there is no law. And it's done from the very foundation of the world. And I'm telling you this morning, he knew exactly what you would be going through today. He knew exactly what you would be facing. And I want to get this right. All, uh, September 26, 2021. Did I get it right this time? Yes, I believe so. The 26th of September, he knew exactly what you were facing from the foundation, how does that make you feel this morning? That if the spotlight from heaven was to drop directly on you, it would be knowing the fact that, God, you know me. You love me. You are for me. I am not the tail. I'm the head, God. Because you said I'm the apple of your eye, God. All these promises, all these promises I speak of are for you individually. You say, God, I failed you too much. No, you haven't. If he loved me while I was yet in my sins, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. I'm not talking about we can go out and willfully transgress and sin, but I'm talking about when we do fail God. We have an advocate that he, he's there. He's an intercessor for us. He's the one that calls up and says, Father, they're weak, they're frail, but I have went to the cross for them just knowing that they would fail. And when he calls us, he calls us in our mistakes. And I, I, I love that thought. To realize that he didn't look at Johnny in my good times. He looked at Johnny in my bad times. And he still loved me. That blows my mind. You see, God does not want us to be timid. He wants us to be bold about our testimony. And the only way we can be bold, church, is by 
his spirit. He then tells them to stand still. Boy, when I was a young and coming up, my dad could, I think that's why I'm half bald today. My dad could grab the back of my hair and lift me up by, to get me to sit still. In church, we didn't have iPhones, iPads, nothing. We sat there and maybe got a mint from my mom if we were good. Her, I, I could smell her purse right now. It smelled like peppermint. Well, she would pull it out and she would give it to us. But he would mm, jack us up. And that was, that was the last step before we went out to the front of the church. And he introduced us to cowhide leather. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. But you see, in the spirit, it's just as hard a lot of times for God's people to stand still. I couldn't help but thinking about when we have vacation Bible school and things are so chaotic. And all of a sudden, one of them says, everybody stand by the wall. And all of a sudden, all the kids stand by the wall. And they're like at attention most of the time. There's something about standing that takes a chaotic moment and brings order to it. You see, God didn't say sit. He didn't. Now, there are places where he talked about sitting and laying. But here he didn't talk about laying down or sitting or, or squatting or sitting down Indian style. He said to stand. You see, we feel like we need to be moving all the time, doing something uh, and to fix the situation. But I want to tell you something I didn't even think about before until I, till I, it just came to me at the computer. Standing is an action word. Y'all take that in just a second. It's a verb. It's not putting anything in neutral. It's making myself stand in position. It's an action. So we are doing what God tells us to do. We are being in action. But I'm telling you this morning, you see, we want to be doing something. We feel we got to get involved in God's work. And God's telling us to stand. Just stand. You know why? Because I'm fixing to show you something that's going to blow your mind. I'm fixing to take care of a situation that you don't think I can take care of. I read one commentary. It, it talked about a man that said his youngins used to, I think about Mike, used to flex their arms. He's like, Daddy, boy, you got a big muscle. I don't remember Ashlyn doing that because, you know, now if I did that, I think the muscle would go the other way because it's kind of covered in a little fluff, you know. That's why I wear a jacket. A jacket covers a multitude of fat. You see? But there was a day I was young and debonair and I could throw it up and you walk by a mirror and you do like that so they could see your tricep. But guess what? Life has a way of taking that away. Things change. <laughs> Circumstance happens. Too many drive throughs Too many potatoes and carbs and all that. But I'm serving a God who never changes. When he flexes 2,000 years ago, whoo, look at that muscle. And when he flexes today, it's the same muscle because he's an all-powerful, an all-knowing God. He knows exactly what you need today, and he's powerful enough to do it. He is all-powerful. And when he was standing on the side, Moses says, just stand still and watch the salvation of the Lord. Because why? Because God was fixing to do something that blew their mind. You see, they didn't have this. They didn't, couldn't read about the children crossing the Red Sea. They couldn't see about the storms being uh, calm. They couldn't see uh, the deliverance that happened to the demoniac. They couldn't see all of that, but we can. All they were doing was just standing still because Moses told them to. I believe Moses probably didn't go, hey, guys, let's. I believe he was stern and said, stand still and see the salvation of God. And guess what? God showed up. He tells them to see. That's the third thing. See the salvation of God today. God wants to do great things in your life. And you may say, Johnny, y'all get up there and you talk about that stuff all the time. But my circumstance is not changing and I'm telling you today I don't care if it don't change for 10 years it's still the truth God is able and God can turn things we've seen a thing happen last Sunday morning God turned a situation around just like that multiple situations just like that just like that you see God wants to do 
great things. And, and this, is, this is a key point here that, that I put down. When Moses said, the Egyptians you see today, you won't see them again. Whew. <laughs> you see, you may be here today, and you may have been delivered out of a lot of things. But there are times that you look back at your past and you can see a little bit of dust, a little bit of pursuing going on, a little bit of things happening in your life that bring fear to you to say, God, I don't want to go back. And I, I see the hellhounds out there barking at me. And God said, stand and see my salvation. What's been taunting you for 400 years, the life that you knew for 400 years. You don't know anything different. You don't know the days of Joseph. You don't know those days because you've been under bondage. But I'm telling you what I'm fixing to do to the ones that kept you bondage. I'm fixing to cover them up where you don't have to see them again. And I'm telling you this morning, don't get halfway. Allow God to cover that mess up because that's why Paul says, not looking to the past, not looking back there where we had problems. He said, but I look ahead toward the mark of, of the calling in Christ Jesus that's what he wants us to do to look forward because he's able to remove that stuff. He's able to take care of it. You see, keep singing. There are people that need to hear your song. And this is what the Lord put on my heart. God will provide the audience. He will provide the audience right in the middle of your trial you see, I can't go far from here without thinking about the story in Acts chapter 16 when Paul and Silas were both thrown in jail. And at the midnight hour, the Bible said, they prayed and they sang praises unto God. And it said, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loose. That means their chains fell off that was binding them. Every one of them, not just Paul and Silas, but every one of them in the jail. And it says, And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light. And sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. You see Paul and Silas, if you read leading up to it, they had been beaten. They were covered with uh, whip lashings on their bodies and they were bound in chains in the inner part of the prison but what did they do in their circumstance they begin to sing they begin to sing above their circumstance they begin to sing of, uh, uh, you know, outside of what they were seeing closed in around them they begin to see to an almighty God who had changed her life who had turned them around and guess what happened? An earthquake happened and the chains fell off the other prisoners. They fell right off and the door swung open of every cell that was in that prison. And the thought came to me, oh, whose chains are fixing to be broken when you start singing your song? Whose cell door is going to come open when you start singing your song? What kind of earthquake is going to happen? And this is the thing, like I said, you don't have to get up here to sing that, that, la, la, that song, la, la, la. You don't have to sing it, but it's what resonates from your heart to people. I watched yesterday as Benji conducted a funeral for his co-workers, and Rhonda came up to me, and we were discussing. She said, oh, Benji did pretty good because it's tough being, doing that in front of your co-workers. It really is. It's tough. Because they see things of you. They see the sides of you. When, that, when you go through things at work and things that happen. But well, Benji stood up there and I sat back and watched. I was thankful that I didn't have to do anything in it except just go. And I was standing there. And I watched people that I didn't know come up and hug Benji. And cry on Benji's shoulder. People, generations of people, people that he had talked about that he had been part of their funeral. That he had worked with from a young man. 
And I sat back and I said, Benji is singing his song. Benji may never preach. Benji may never do these things that, that God's called other people to do. But yesterday at Santa Fe Cemetery, he sang his song and God used him and people were affected by it. And that's what I'm talking about this morning here at the Samson City Church of God. Don't let Satan take your song. There's people relying on your song. There's people relying on, on what God has done for you because if they see it in you, they have hope for themselves and they can believe if God can do it for him or her, he can do it for me. It may not happen overnight. It may not happen immediately, but there's coming a day when they call upon the same God that delivered you, that set you free, that's helped you. I hear clap. Let's clap for the Lord this morning. Praise God. Keep singing. Keep singing. You may be here this morning. Alex, come on up, brother. You may be singing here this morning, and you don't know the song that I'm talking about. You see, the world will give you a song. Last weekend was kind of a busy week, and we had Sister Diane's funeral. But on Saturday after the funeral, Ashlyn and I and Regina and uh, one of Ashlyn's friend, we went to the Alabama game. And there was 90, 000, over 90,000 people in that stadium. And I was sitting there, and, and, and I get in a situation, I'm like, how many of these people going to make it to heaven? I'll be, I'll be thinking about stuff. I told Brother John, I said, is that weird thinking? Uh, he said, no, Johnny. But they begin, if you've ever been to a Gator game, they, there's songs that they sing throughout the game. And one of them was Tom Petty's song at the beginning of the fourth quarter, I Won't Back Down. 90,000 people in a stadium singing together, I Won't Back Down, with their cell phones lit up. It is a roar that I cannot describe. A roar of unity, a, 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 a roar of togetherness, loud it's just unbelievable how loud it is. But guess what? That really was for nothing. It's, it's a good thing to, to make the game fun. But 90,000 people just singing is just singing. Friday night before the Alabama game, Ashley and Regina and I drove to Tampa very quickly, went to Tampa, and went to a worship conference, a concert. And there was... 300 people at this church. <laughs> and they begin to sing on the stage. And from the first song, the Spirit of God fell in that place. And it was all about Jesus. And I felt the hot tears flow. I felt God just do all kinds of things for two hours there in the presence of God with 300 people. And I asked Ashlyn last night, and I asked Regina, I said, which one did you enjoy more? They said, Friday night. You know why? Because those 300 people were singing their individual songs in unity to a God that delivered them, the God that saved them, the God that helped them. There was more power in those 300 voices singing than there were in the 90,000 singing the world song. And I'm telling you this morning, if you've lost your song, if circumstances have bound you down, fear not, stand still. And remember and see the salvation of God. And if you're here today, you don't know Jesus. It's as easy as saying, God, I don't understand this, what Johnny's saying. It sounds like a bunch of gibberish. But God, I feel something this morning. And Jesus, I need your help. I'm tired of doing it like this. I'm tired of failing. I'm tired of the battle. God, help me. And the Bible said he is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness.